Welcome back guys. Today's video I wanted to talk quickly about something that's near and dear to my heart because it's something that I've had to learn as I go entirely since I got into crypto and that's security. Um, so today's video is kind of a security 101 or you know best security practices. Just simple stuff. It's very important that I want to make sure that I get across to everyone. So to get started the first thing that I'd like to touch on is password strength or passwords in general. So there are some services, whether they be paid or free, um, like I think LastPass, where you can have something generate a password for you that's long and has you know a, a wide variation of alphanumerical characters. And it does that so that it's not as easy to crack or not as easy to guess for someone who's trying to get in to your accounts or trying to do something dishonest. So I'd like to emphasize that although maybe, you know, the name of your favorite football team and your mother's birth year might seem like not something that's easy to guess, but any kind of personal identifiers in a password um, can really make or break it, especially if they're short words or if they're, you know, numbers that are very easily guessed, like one, two, three, four, things like that. The next thing that you should get into the habit of using or at least get accustomed with is two-factor authentication. This is a crucial part in protecting yourself and security overall. Um, me using it personally has made me feel significantly better about my holdings and about where I keep things and just all my personal accounts, whether it be emails, bank account, whatever. Um, it's made me feel a lot better about the fact that I know that there's at least a second barrier there as far as protection. And it gives you a six digit number that basically refreshes every minute or so. And it's uh, specific to the site that you're trying to log into. So you can't get past, you know, name or uh, username and password because it's going to ask you for the code. If you don't have the code, you can't get in. When you go to use the app on a new website or a new account, what's going to happen is it's going to say here either manually enter this code or scan the QR code. And you've probably seen that. It's a little square. It's got, you know, weird little images in it. And basically what you do is you take your phone, you use the camera on the app, and it will scan the code. And then a, a little entry will pop up in the app that will say, you know, um, Binance, and then it will show a code. And after that, then the website is going to give you, I think it's like a 16 digit code as a backup code. So if you lose the application, you know, like mine, it backs up to a cloud so I can get it. But if you lose the application, or you lose your phone, that code that Binance or whatever site you just logged into spits out is another backup master code just in case you don't have the application so you don't have that six digit code to get back in. The next thing I'd like to go over is wallets. So using secure and reputable wallets is very important. Ideally using the core wallets or the wallets that came out directly from the development team for whatever project that you're investing in is important. If you inevitably do download a core wallet or some sort of third party wallet, whatever it might be, you wanna let it sync fully, you know, catch up with the blockchain before you send it any transactions chances are it wouldn't cause a problem anyways, but it's always better to err on the side of safety. So wait till it sinks, till it's all ready to go. Sometimes I'll even close out the wallet, restart it, make sure that it starts back up from where it was, that it's all synced, that there's no issues. Some wallets like the Lisk wallet, when you open them for the first time, they're gonna give you a string of words, 12 words, um, that basically is your backup phrase. So if your computer sets on fire one day and you buy a new computer and you download the Lisk wallet, if you put in those 12 words into the wallet, it's gonna restore your wallet from where it was. So that will never be lost. If you have the means to do so and it makes sense for you, I would suggest buying a hardware wallet, something like a Ledger Nano S or any of the Ledger products or a Trezor. I say that because as far as peace of mind goes, it is nice to know where something is centrally located and to make you feel better just about the safety and the security of it. My final suggestion, if you do get a hardware wallet, somebody gave me this piece of advice and it's stuck with me and I pass it on whenever I can. If you get the Ledger Nano S, put, you know, $10 worth of cryptocurrencies on it and then wipe it, do a complete reset on it and start from the, the beginning with the seed and, back, and get it so it restores. That way, you know two things. You know, one, that your ledger is functioning properly if it restores and your cryptocurrencies are still there. And two, you know that you know how to do it. That brings me to my next point, which is understanding the difference between a public key and a private key. So for this example, I'm going to use a postage mailbox, okay? So the slot that everybody puts the mail in um, would be your public key. You can send uh, cryptocurrencies to that address, goes there nice and safe and sound, but once it's sent, can't come back out, right? So once you drop a letter in a post office box, usually unless it's your own, you can't reach back in and get it out. 
Now, a private key would be the key that the mailman has that lets him in through the back door to open it up and take all those letters out. So a, a public key is something that you can share freely with people. It's an address that funds can be received on. Whereas the private key is essentially the, if you were trying to log into your bank account, it would be the same thing as giving somebody your email and password. Um, so you want to keep that private key safe because as the name states, it should be private because it gives you access to all of your funds. The next thing I'd like to touch on is double checking your address. So there are malicious programs out there that are specifically designed to recognize that you did a copy paste procedure and basically paste the wrong address. So that if you're not looking at the address that you pasted in your wallet, wherever it might be, you could be sending your funds to an account that's not your own. So what I suggest doing is, you know, checking the, you know, the first couple digits, maybe the last couple digits and sending a test transaction, something very small, maybe just enough to cover the transaction fee, or if it's something that doesn't have a transaction fee, even better. But that way you have peace of mind so that you know it's going to the right address and that everything is functioning properly. Also worth mentioning that when you are using your Ledger Nano S, if you're going to send a transaction, the little screen on the ledger should show you the address that you're sending it to so that you can validate what you're sending it to and whatever the website or whatever wallet that they match so that there's no issues there either. While we're on the topic of addresses, you want to also check the URL address. For example, if you've ever used Binance, um, when you're going to log in, it says, please make sure that you're logging into, you know, Binance.com or whatever. Um, and they, it's there for a reason because they want to make sure that someone's not trying to make a fictitious site to pretty much steal your login information. Next is backups. This is something I do almost obsessively because to me, it really is the best way for me physically to feel like I've done something to protect myself. So there's some wallets that give you the option to back up the wallet dat file or the information on the wallet so that it can be restored on another location or another computer if something happens. I have multiple external hard drives, I have multiple um, USB drives, I have a little safe that I have things in, um, and I try to differentiate where I keep things and make sure that it's spread out because you really don't want stuff to be in a centralized location. With cryptocurrencies, you are your own bank, and there's a plus and a minus side to that. The plus side is you have complete control of your funds, and the minus side is there's no insurance policy or no backup if you don't take care of it. This is the biggest one. If anybody takes anything away from this video, I probably should have done this one first, to be honest with you, but if you take anything away from this video, please, for the love of all that is holy, do not leave your cryptocurrencies, any, even if it's $5 worth, on an exchange. If you do not hold the private keys to your wallet, you do not have your cryptocurrencies. I feel like every month there's another issue or another drama with an exchange. It started with Mt. Gox and apparently people didn't learn their lesson because recently BitGrail did the same thing and in the, you know, the, the owner of the website is trying to pose as a hack when it's pretty obvious that he just sold the funds. So if you leave your cryptocurrencies on an exchange, you are at the mercy of the people running that exchange. Those are the main key points I wanted to touch on. Um, so you can click away from this video now if you don't want to hear my story, but I kind of wanted to give a little background, a little history as to why I did this video. So some of you follow me on Twitter or in my Discord or whatever. Approximately two weeks ago, you probably saw my tweet where I said, well, my master node was stolen. So I want to give a little clarity to that. Basically what happened was I invested in this coin that I knew that wasn't worth very much. Mostly it was supposed to be a learning experience for me because I just wanted to say that I ran a masternode. So I bought enough for a masternode, I hung on to it for a couple months, couldn't figure out how to run it. Finally, I had someone help me set up a VPS server, which basically means that the wallet was running on a remote server that was up 24 seven. And so that the wallet was always connected to the blockchain. The wallet was always doing what it was supposed to be doing. And I was getting my masternode rewards, so on and so forth. Well, I didn't really set up the VPS myself. Somebody else set it up for me. I mean, I had all the login information. It was all specific to me. It was all private. Nobody else knew it, but I didn't realize that I should have set up two-factor authentication on the website. Um, I guess what happened was, supposedly, is that there's websites out there that publish passwords. So if somebody happens to figure out your password, they may submit it to this website. Um, some people can use it as a tool to figure out if their information has been compromised. And unfortunately, some people like me don't know those websites exist. So if your password gets published, it can be used negatively. 
and that's what happened. So people were building or are building bots right now pretty much to take all of those passwords and just run through all of these VPS sites because they know that people like me are running masternodes on them. So, you know, my password wasn't password, but somebody figured out what it was, got in, and I got home from work one day and I went to go check it and there was a transaction for 2,500 coins out the door. So, and I'm, you know, I do everything else. I do two-factor on everything else. I back up my passwords. I save stuff. I use, you know, passwords that are at least relatively difficult to guess. Um, and I tried to do everything right. And I thought that I was on the right path. But you learn very quickly that it is very easy to be susceptible to these things. And um, no one is off limits. I'm sharing the story because I know that a lot of you think that I'm a professional or that maybe I have some exponential knowledge in cryptocurrencies. But as I've stated before, I make these videos to teach myself stuff and it also benefits you guys because now I'm explaining it to you because I better understand it. So me learning from my mistake could also help you guys and I would rather share this story and be honest and upfront about what happened so that maybe it doesn't happen to one of you. So if you're using one of those sites, um, make sure to be using two-factor authentication, make sure it's a reputable site. I'll put the link in the description for the website that publishes the passwords. I gotta remember what it is, I, I wrote it down somewhere. So that you can check yours too and you can make sure that you're not on there. Again, all these things are precautionary, nothing is 100%, and unfortunately there's a lot of bad actors out there trying to do very dishonest things. But we can certainly put up a good fight and try to prevent those things from happening. And I hope that some of the tips today, maybe you heard of them and you just haven't done it yet, or maybe it's something you've been putting off, but I hope that this video was um, incentive enough for you to go about it and do it now and set it up to protect yourself. That pretty much does it for today's video. I just wanted to touch on some security features, some security protocol things that I think are important, stuff that you guys should make sure that you're doing. Um, if you wanna pop into my Discord and say hi, feel free to do so. I will leave the link in the description. You can also support my channel through my Patreon account if you'd like to do so. I have donation addresses down there somewhere. But other than that, I appreciate the views and the support, guys. I wanna thank you for watching, and I will see you all soon.